Hi everyone, this lesson is on a parasitic worm infection known as Loa Loa or Loasis, which is also known as African eye worm, which is going to tell us some of the findings we're going to see in this condition. So we're going to talk about how individuals become infected with this particular parasitic worm, what are some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So Loa Loa is a nematode or roundworm, so it's going to be an infection that occurs via a bite from certain types of flies. Now, these particular flies are going to be the deer fly, horse fly, or mango fly. It was a particularly neglected infection in the past because it was thought to be benign, but now there's some new evidence showing that there is associated increased morbidity and mortality when patients are not treated. And some of these we're going to discuss later, but some of these can include issues with the heart and the kidneys. And this particular parasitic worm is going to be endemic to equatorial Africa. So it's going to be mostly in Central Africa. So we see it in places like Angola, Cameroon, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and Chad. 3 to 13 million people are infected with this particular parasitic worm. And there is upwards of 30 million people that are at risk. So how do humans become infected with this particular worm? So as mentioned before, it's going to be in the, the bite of some of those fly species we talked about before, particularly the deer fly, which is also known as Chrysops salacea. So this particular fly species can harbor what we call L3 larvae. So these are the, going to be the particular stage of this worm that are infective. And these worms will enter into a human host when this particular fly bites a person. And more specifically, what can happen is when a fly lands on a human, on their skin, it takes a blood meal, it takes a bite, those worms can exit from the fly and enter into the patient's subcutaneous tissues. Now, they're going to be in the L3 stage, that stage that is able to cause infection, but it's not the mature stage yet. It has to go through several different stages, which can take weeks before they can become mature adults. And what can happen is once these worms have matured into adult worms. There can be a female, there can be a male worm. The female worms are going to be larger than the male worms. And the females can produce anywhere from 12,000 to 39,000 larval worms, which are called microfilariae. And they're going to be sheathed microfilariae. We're going to discuss why this is important when we talk about some of the diagnosis later on in this lesson. But this is going to be in contrast to other worm infections like river blindness, for instance. So a female worm can produce 12,000 to 39,000 of these sheathed microfilariae worms per day. And these worms can then enter into the bloodstream. We can often see these microfilariae worms in the bloodstream during the daytime. And then at nighttime, we can see the worms in different parts of the body. So again, it takes time for this process to occur from the time where a fly bites and injects those L3 larvae to the point when a female worm has started to produce tens of thousands of microfilariae per day. That time period is anywhere from 150 to 170 days. These sheath microfilariae worms will not start to be produced until 150 to 170 days after initial infection. And we can also find these worms in the urine and spinal fluid as well. So some of the main issues with regards to this worm include dermal invasion. As mentioned before, the worm can enter into the skin, often in loose connective tissues in the subcutaneous layers of the skin, and also can enter into the conjunctiva of the eye. We'll discuss this here in a moment. However, having said all that, many patients can be asymptomatic. So they can have these worms in the skin that are producing tens of thousands of those larval worms, and they don't have symptoms at all. So there is a particular percentage of patients that are, don't experience any symptoms at all. However, if patients do experience symptoms, they can have what we call calabar swelling. So calabar swelling is going to be a recurring swelling of the skin. So we can see a swelling that occurs and then it can go away and then it can come back in a different part of the body and can go away. This is likely due to an immune response to microfilariae worms or to pieces of the adult worm. So that leads to some immune response where the patient has swelling in different parts of the body. Now, patients will along with the swelling have pruritus or an itching sensation. So where we have swelling, they can have itching. And it's going to be non-painful, so the swelling is not going to be painful, it's just going to be a swelling. 
and it's going to occur mostly near joints. Now, we can often see it with the knees and the elbows in particular, but it can occur throughout the body. So patients can have recurring swelling on different parts of the body that goes along with itching, and this can occur around the body, but again, most of the time around joints. Now, in some cases, patients can actually see a worm moving. So patients have reported seeing worms moving under the skin, so that can be very disconcerting for a patient. Now, patients can also have eye worms as well. So eye worms, this is where the worm itself is now in the conjunctiva of the eye, and it is literally traversing the conjunctiva. So patients themselves may actually see the worm crossing the conjunctiva, so they can see it in their vision, a worm moving through their vision. A clinician can also see this as well and could remove it if need be, but oftentimes the worm will leave the eye and move into a different part of the body. So they can move around, so they can be in the eye temporarily. It's also been noted in the eyelid as well. And the difference with this particular worm infection compared to a condition like river blindness, for instance, is that there is no permanent damage to the eye. So that's going to be something important to point out here, especially when we talk about treatments later. So those are going to be the most common findings, but we can also see issues like severe headaches in patients with loa loa infections. So these have been described as violent in severity. So very extreme headaches can occur. Arthralgias, so so joint pain, we can see muscle aches and pains as well. And then fatigue has also been noted. So patients can feel very, very tired. And some patients can have swollen, tender lymph nodes as well. And then there are certain comorbidities that have been more recently shown to occur in patients who have low, low infections. These include endomyocardial fibrosis. So inside the heart, in the muscle of the heart, there can be fibrosis that occurs. So scarring, there can be nephropathy. So there can be damage to the kidneys. So there can be kidney disease that can occur with long-term low, low infections, and then also neuropsychiatric complications and also spontaneous encephalitis. So even though patients may feel fine, they have no symptoms at all, they can end up having some of these complications later in their life. So this is the reason why, although it was neglected in the past, it's becoming more and more dealt with now. Now let's discuss the diagnosis of low, low infections. So the typical way of diagnosing this is by blood smear staining. So you take a blood smear, you can literally see microfilariae or adult worms in the blood smear. Some newer methods of diagnosis include PCR. And then if you were to do blood work and you were to look at IgG4 and IgE levels, they are elevated in patients with low, low infections. Another important point to make note of here is that because this particular worm infection can appear like some other infections like river blindness, so low river blindness has damage to the eyes leading to blindness, and this condition doesn't, we can still see microfilariae in each of these different types of conditions. So we can see microfilariae in low low, we can see it in river blindness, but the difference here is that microfilariae are sheathed, and in river blindness they're non-sheathed. So if you were to see a test question, or if you were to see a skin snip biopsy from someone that has onchocerciasis, which is river blindness, and you see sheathed microfilariae, well, then they also at least have low, low infections as well, because again, river blindness, the worm that causes river blindness is unsheathed. Now, once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat this condition? So the treatment is going to involve diethylcarbamazine. So this is going to be a treatment that we don't often see. It's going to be for low, low infections. It can also be used for infections like elephantiasis, which is caused by Uteraria bancrofti infections. Now, what's important with regards to diethylcarbamazine is that if a patient has high levels of these loa loa worms, so if you were to see a very, very high level in blood smear or staining, for instance, it can be dangerous to give patients diethylcarbamazine early because it's best to bring down the level of microfilariae first. Because if you were to give diethylcarbamazine too early, this can cause widespread death of too many microfilariae worms, which can cause an immune reaction in the central nervous system of patients who have this condition, and they can have severe complications due to it. So what we want to do is we want to give them albendazole if they have a very high level of microfilariae. So that's very important. And I also forget to mention that diethylcarbamazine can be used for preventative purposes as well to prevent patients from getting infections with low, low in the first place. Now, what's 
very, very important to make note of here is the fact that we want to and we must avoid use of ivermectin when a patient has a low, a low infection. So why do I bring this up? The reason I bring this up is because most of healthcare focus is on river blindness because of the fact that it can cause blindness in patients. But the treatment for river blindness is ivermectin. Now, river blindness can occur in similar areas to low low infections. But the problem is that if a patient is co-infected, so they may have river blindness, but they may also have low loa, if we were to only focus on river blindness, we don't even check to see if the patient has low loa, and we give the patient ivermectin, this can cause severe reactions. And the reactions can become life-threatening. So we can see in patients who are given ivermectin when they have low loa, severe encephalopathy, confusion, even death in some cases. So a lot of times this particular condition, loa loa, was considered more of a benign condition but was only usually dealt with in patients who have river blindness because of this particular issue. But now we know that loa loa infections also have their own issues so we also have to deal with those as well. So this is the reason why I bring this up because these infections can co-occur both river blindness and loa loa and using ivermectin is the treatment for river blindness, but if we use it in patients who have low loa this can cause life-threatening complications, we want to always screen for low loa in patients with river blindness. Please check out my full lesson on river blindness if you want more information on that particular condition. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And also consider joining as a member. That would be a tremendous help for the channel. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.